Hi, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Today, we're going to have a sneak preview of Memphis Area Master Gardener's big event. Coming up this weekend, Spring Fling. We'll show you how to make a hummingbird feeder and Master Gardener Tom Mishore gets our garden started with a few cool seasoned vegetables. And if moles have taken over your yard, stay tuned. Mr. D is here to show us one way to get rid of them. That's just ahead on the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Callie Boyard. Callie is a master gardener right here in Shelby County and Amanda Rideout. She's also a master gardener right here in Shelby County. Okay, Amanda, spring fling is coming. So can yes. you tell us a little bit about it? Spring fling is this Friday and All this right. Saturday at the Red Barn at the Agri Center. Okay. It's a free event. It's open to the public from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day. Okay. And we will have speakers, demonstrations, plants, things for the kids, and a lot to do. Okay. Uh, today we've got Callie here, and she's going to show us one of the demonstrations that we're going to have at Spring Fling, which is how to build a bird feeder out of a wine bottle. Okay, Callie. We like demonstrations. Yes, I right? do. Yeah. Let's get to it. <laughs> well, here are um, hummingbird feeders that I've made already. And I just want to tell you that it's not my original idea. I found this on Pinterest on the internet. Hmm. Okay. But I thought that this would be a really good project because it's recycling. Mm -hmm. It has to do with our spring fling. It, it was fun to make. It was real crafty. Good. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a wine bottle and you're going to soak it for a couple of hours to take off the labels. Okay. And then this is what you come up with, and either green or white, doesn't matter. Your wire is um, a 16 gauge wire. You need your hummingbird feeders that you can get online, and glass and bead glue. You need wire cutters, some glass beads, and we're ready to start the project. Okay, let's get it started. Okay. Yeah. I cut this wire just to be, just to work it out a little bit. Okay. And um, what we're going to do is going to wrap it around. And the nice thing about this wire is that it is bendable and you can bend it. You can make whatever design you want. So whatever you want it to be, you can do that. That's the neat thing about right. this. But you just tighten it up and you just wrap it around. And then we're just going to wrap it around here again. Okay. And we'll call that done. <laughs> and I'll show you how it works. Now, one neat thing with that wire is you could maybe roll beads. If you didn't have the glass beads, mm -hmm. you could add some beads and kind of circle them around after you got comfortable with that wire, I'm exactly. sure. Exactly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little piece of wire and just bend the ends here. And I'm going to put it on the bottom. Oops. And then you've got your handle like that. And for time's sake, what we're going to do is we're going to hot glue gun the beads instead of using the glass and bead uh, adhesive because that'll take about uh, 24 hours to set up. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to push some glue in some areas. And yeah, you can do that for me. And it just sticks right on there. Mm-hmm. And the adhesive, okay. the oh, glue and heat ad adhesive will take that's a little cool. while longer. And you can just keep putting beads everywhere you want. Huh. And the hummingbirds love the color. They, um, they don't have a sense of smell, they have a sense of sight. Okay. So what you want to do is you just want to make it nice and colorful and there you go. And add that red. And, okay. and then you put the bird feeder, stopper feeder, on the top. All right. And cool. you make sure you fill it. And there it is for hanging. All right, we appreciate that, Miss Callie. Oh, sure. It's real nice. 
Okay. All right, Amanda, what are some other spring fling events that are going to be going on? Well, we're going to have some speakers that are going to be talking about hummingbirds and how to attract them to your yard okay. and flowers and things that you can plant. Also, just basic um, food that you can feed the hummingbirds, which is generally the four parts water to okay. one part sugar. Uh, we don't add any dyes to that food because uh, that is harmful to the hummingbirds. Okay. Uh, we'll also have a children's area mm -hmm. on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And there we're going to have a lot of hands-on activities for the kids. They're going to get to plant seeds and Good. eat eat celery and carrots and things that <laughs> stuff they don't want to eat. Right. Stuff they don't want to eat, <laughs> yeah, but we're promoting it in a fun way and the the volunteers that we have are teachers mm -hmm. and our master gardeners yes. and they have a love for kids and education mm -hmm. and they mix it in a fun great way. Good. Um, We'll also have our Ask a Master Gardener yes. Clinic, which is one of my favorites. And I always, to. yeah, I, well, <laughs> yes, it is. I, I do encourage everyone to bring their gardening problems, dilemmas. It may seem simple, but there mm -hmm. might be an easy solution. Sure. And then, of course, Ask a Master Gardener loves a challenge. That's so right. I always encourage people to bring that too. Right, they can bring their weed samples Any or whatever the samples. case may be. Yeah, we have soil boxes and all those other kind of publications. Definitely. So, yeah. And we'll make sure we get them the right answers that they're looking for. Is there a theme for this year? This year's okay. theme is uh, Eat Up, and that's okay. mainly for eat the kids. Up. And that's why we're going to have root vegetables okay. and different parts of the plants, lettuce as far as the leaf, the things that they can eat. Okay. Um, we'll also have our Junior Daffodil Show. Mm -hmm. And so we encourage the kids to go out in their yard or their neighbor's mm -hmm. yard if they allow mm -hmm. and pick a daffodil or two and bring it in and There'll be little vials, little tubes with water okay. that they'll get to put their name on and get to compete in, in the Daffodil Show. Okay. I understand that was a lot of fun last year. That was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. I'm, I think we had a, almost 100 entries at just a long table full of daffodils, and the children really enjoyed it because they get to see how many different types there are. It's okay. amazing what's in everyone's yard. Good, and the daffodils are up and blooming right now, so. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Yeah, so get those on in for that This contest. weekend, they're still there. Mm -hmm, that's right. <laughs> We'll have lots of plants. Okay. Uh, the Master plants. Gardeners will have their best plant sale mm -hmm. where the Master Gardeners have grown these plants over the winter and okay. the fall, and we will be selling those. Uh, our vendors will also have arts and crafts, garden items, whether it's bird feeders, bird houses. Mm. And there will also be food available. So there you will be food. Yeah, We're be working food. Uh, with the Memphis Food Truck Alliance good, this good, year. Good. And they are having a couple of food trucks there. So we're going to have some good barbecue and just some different southern food. That will be great. That should be good. So you can shop and eat all shop at the same time. Shop and eat huh? and have a wonderful time. Okay. Now last year, I understand, what, over 2,000 people? Over 2,000 mm, people came, good. so it was a great two days, and we're looking forward to a great time this year, too. Good. We just hope Mother Nature cooperates with <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we always do. And we are prepared because the speakers are inside a tent, and the gardeners, um, the vendors that are outside, they have tents, and they're prepared. So rain or shine, we're there. We've got it all available. All right, so there you have it. Spring fling. Come on out. Have a good time. Up next, Master Gardener Tom Mashure gets our garden started with a few cool season vegetables. But first, here are a few gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks that might interest you. What we're doing today is planting a cool season crop. We already planted uh, three little hills of uh, leaf lettuce. And I plant them in the middle. So around the circumference, I plan to plant cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. And hopefully, they will help shade the leaf lettuce. They'll last a little bit longer than they would be if I just planted them by themselves. Uh, next thing we're going to plant is uh, bulbing onions. Now, bulbing onions. What I like to do is plant the onions very shallow so that when they form the bulb, they'll, the bulb will set on top of the soil and uh, not in the soil. And again, like I said, very shallow. About three inches apart is more than enough. Don't even have to use a trowel. 
being a retired military man, I like things in rolls, uniform. These are called onion sets. They look like miniature onions, but they'll get to be big boys as they get a little bit older. And by the way, anytime you put in new plants, ones that you grow or ones that you buy, before you plant them, you want to make sure you water them in their container to give them that little extra drink before they uh, encounter the real world where they'll spend the rest of their life. On this side of the bed, we're going to go ahead and plant uh, cauliflower. When you take it out, put your fingers on both sides of the plant, push on the bottom, and out it comes. Now, if this was really heavy rooted, I would want to take a knife and cut those roots. Otherwise, the roots would just grow in a circle. By taking a knife and slicing down through the sides, it forces the roots to grow out, and that's the way you want to do it. But this is not that bad. Sometimes you see people taking and pulling the plant out of the container. That may or may not work, but uh, it may also pull the plant right off the roots. There we go. A good, a good root structure. The same depth as it was in the container. Okay, we're going to do the last one now. Now this cauliflower came with its own little markers. However, when you grow your own, you probably don't have a marker. One of the tricks the master gardeners use is we use cut up mini blinds that's probably in your attic and use a number two pencil. It does not wash out, doesn't fade in the sun, whereas ink ones do. I like to write down what it is and the date I put it in the ground. Okay, we're going to plant some broccoli now, and depending on how much space you got available in your garden, preferably about two feet apart. However, if you're kind of tight like I am, or it's a smaller garden, that uh, 18 inches is sufficient. They'll work. Now, I did pre-water the plants before I put them in. I want to give them the best head start I can. You want to plant them about the same depth as you had in the container. Now these I grew from seed at the house. When you take it out, again, put your fingers around the plant, flip it over, push on the bottom or squeeze it until it comes out in a ball. Put it back, put it in the soil about the same depth it was in the container and firm the soil around it. This one's going to be about 18 inches apart. I do reuse my containers for starting more seeds. Fingers, both sides of the plant, flip it over, push on the bottom or the sides, and it comes out. You notice it's got a good root structure all the way around. Firm the soil around it. If you don't get it exactly 18 inches, I guarantee you no one's going to go out there with a ruler and measure it. Well, my wife may. Not very difficult, very fun. And I go out and check my garden every day, see how much it's grown from the previous day. All right, Mr. D is here, and we're going to talk about moles, which happens to be one of the questions we get a lot this time of the year. Those moles, how can we get rid of them, Mr. D? Can you help us out? I can. I Good. can help you out. Uh, you know, it's, unless it's changed, it's the number one question mm -hmm. that uh, extension offices get nationwide. Uh, nationwide. Number one okay. question. And we always have people that, uh, that need help. Mm -hmm. But the, the best way, in my opinion, to control moles is by using a trap. Okay. We've got a couple of, ex of examples here with us today. This is the harpoon style right here. And you simply pull this up, you set it over a uh, tunnel, a transportation tunnel. And remember, I said transportation. Right. And uh, you should uh, 
uh, have pretty good luck of uh, catching your mold. And this is a choker type trap right here. And in my opinion, this one, <laughs> personally, I've, been, I've had more luck with, with this type of trap than I have with a harpoon style. Okay. As a matter of fact, I caught, I've caught four in my yard this spring. Okay. And my yard is not that big. And so this is an extremely deadly trap. It's now, how, does, how does that work? Uh, you simply push this down into the ground over the tunnel. And uh, again, a transportation tunnel, not a feeding tunnel. Okay. You step on this and it opens. And go. when the mole comes underneath, it taps the trigger as it raises the tunnel. And these jaws come together and it chokes. Uh -huh. It basically squeezes the breath out of him. Uh, it's bloodless. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, however, oh, boy. is not yeah. bloodless. Uh, <laughs> but the key to uh, being successful with a mold trap is placing the traps over a, tr a transportation tunnel. And let's explain between the two, the transportation. Trans transportation. You know, most of the tunnels mm -hmm. in your yard are feeding tunnels. Okay. Moles, a, a mole can, can tunnel over 200 feet in, in one night. Wow. And, you know, I got four moles, that's, that's 800, almost 1,000 feet of tunnels that I have stopped Ooh. happening in my yard. That's a lot of work, in too, the past you think about few it. few weeks, that's mm -hmm. correct. There are two ways to determine transportation tunnels. There's a quick way that works most of the time, and then there's a, sl a slow way that probably <laughs> works every time. Okay. Uh, the quick way is to try and find a long tunnel that may be 10 or 15 feet long that doesn't, that's not, doesn't have branches off to the side okay. where it looks like it's been feeding. The feeding tunnels, many times they'll feed this way for a few minutes and then they'll go back this way and they'll, they'll go back and forth and, and it's a lot of branches. But if you can find a long straight line, put this in the middle of that long straight line and you should be successful. Uh, another way is if you have a lot of energy and need exercise, you <laughs> mash down all the tunnels that you, in your yard <laughs> Uh, and go back the next, you know, do, do it before before dark. Okay. Go, out, go back the next morning, and flag or mark the tunnel, the tunnels that were raised again. Mash them down again, and do that two or three nights. And then if you find a tunnel, that, you know, you, then you can identify the transportation mm -hmm. tunnels. That's the slower way. However, it's pretty much 100% effective. Right. Pretty effective because uh, and and, and if, if you do that, you you will uh, you will be successful in controlling them. Okay. Uh, be careful with these traps. Yes, uh, please. And, and you know, I've got a warning please. here uh, on, on this one right here that <laughs> uh, because you can get squeezed. Yeah. The springs are pretty strong. Uh, these tines are are pretty sharp. Uh, so you want to you want to be careful with them. Uh, but but you know and that's that works better. I know you can purchase. Um, Toxicants and poisons and mm -hmm. things like that, poison peanuts and things like that. But moles are primarily carnivorous. Most of their diet consists of insects, mm -hmm. uh, mostly grub worms and earthworms. That that probably makes up, you know, probably 80 or 90 percent of their diet is grub worms and, and, and earthworms. Uh, they also will eat many many other types of insects and and other things. But they're primarily carnivorous, and uh, I don't think why. I can't understand why a mole that's used to eating a nice, juicy earthworm or grub <laughs> would bite into a poison peanut. Right. I just don't, I can't understand that. Right, uh, right now, they are, uh, they're uh, giving birth to young, uh, March and April. Uh, the average litter is three to five uh, uh, moles. Wow. So, so, you know, I probably, I could have, I could have, you know, I'm assuming that two of the ones I caught were males yeah, and probably. two were females, so I, I probably saved myself from having <laughs> uh, from six to ten more baby moles running around my yard. And as you're saying all of this, the ladies are just moaning and crying. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, I'm really? sorry. You know, it's a cold, man. cruel world out there, yeah. folks. And, you, you know, you either can... You can you can handle the tunnels in your yard. And, you know, they, they really moles... Moles, you know, they aerate your lawn. They, 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 but they actually can do some damage to your turf by... Mm -hmm by, you know, exposing the roots to air and things sure. like that. And, and, you know, also you can, it can cause you to trip and fall and, and break hips and bones and things like that. Yeah. I know, if, especially if there are elderly people around. Sure. Um, so it's uh, something to consider. Uh, but if you don't have any of that and you're not worried about that, let them go because they're probably not doing much physical damage to your, to your, uh, 
you know, turf grass and your ornamentals and things like that. Unlike voles, you know, we're they talking like about moles, moles here. We're not yeah, talking yeah. about voles. There are a couple of really good publications out there. This this is probably one of the best. Uh, and this publication is in the uh, Prevention and Control of Wildlife Damage publication from, I think, the University of Nebraska. And uh, this tells you a little bit about the biology mm -hmm. of the mole. Really, it'll tell you more than you want to know about <laughs> moles. It tells you how much they weigh and exactly what they eat and everything that you want to know about moles. A few okay. things that you don't. And we do have that publication we do have in that our office. At the extension yeah, so office. come on That's by right. and get, get that. that. And this is about a 12-page publication, I, I think. All right, Mr. Uh, Dave, we definitely appreciate that, and hopefully people can get rid of their moles. <laughs> Happy hunting. Happy, Happy hunting. hunting. <laughs> All right. This time of year, we're getting lots of calls from folks who are getting their vegetable gardens going. And one of the things they want to know about is fertilizer. So what is the best fertilizer for vegetables? So, Mr. Dave, how can we help them out with the fertilizers now? That is an easy answer. The, okay. best, the best fertilizer for vegetables is whatever the soil test That's right. that you the soil That's test right. that you've taken uh, recommends. Um, with that being said, you know most vegetables need N, P, and K. This is an example of a complete fertilizer that is balanced. Mm -hmm. It's triple thirteen, and it's uh, has thirteen percent nitrogen, thirteen percent phosphorus, and thirteen percent potassium completely balanced and that's perfect if that's what you need. Mm -hmm. However, uh, uh, one example of where this fertilizer would not be suited is for a legume like right. beans, snap beans, peas, English peas, so southern peas, mm -hmm. things like that are legumes and they don't need any nitrogen. They take nitrogen from the air and fix uh -huh. it in the soil. Uh, so this would not be suited for, for uh, those types of plants. Uh, another case is if you have routinely used this complete <laughs> fertilizer year after year after year after year, I guarantee you the middle number, the phosphorus levels in your soil are uh -huh. high. And if you have extremely high, high or extremely high levels of phosphorus in your soil, it can actually uh, interfere with the uptake of the nitrogen and potassium and the micronutrients. It interferes with the uptake of the other nutrients and it makes your plants look like they're starving to death, mm -hmm. when, which in fact they are, mm -hmm. but it's not because you don't have enough fertilizer out there, it's because you have too much phosphorus. Yeah, and it's tied up all the it's other nutrients. It's tied up. Yeah. So uh, if you have routinely used this every year, <laughs> and I've known of folks that have used, they put you know six pounds of triple 13 yeah. you know, every year out in my garden, and they tell me that, and, <laughs> and I, I, I know they're going to have problems uh, on down the road. And you can't take phosphorus out of the soil. Mm -mm. Uh, the only thing that will take that out is time and plants, you know, and it'll take years right. to get those levels down. You only want them at, you know, medium to high levels. And uh, if you've got medium medium levels mm. of phosphorus and potash in the soils, you don't need right. a complete fertilizer. Because, you know, nowadays you can actually get fertilizers without the middle number, That's without right. the phosphorus. Mm -hmm. 15 0 15, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, 3400 is just nitrogen. Yeah. Uh, Muriate of potash is just yep. the last, last number, number. Uh, and then superphosphate. If that's the only thing you need, that you know you can get that too. Yeah, and people don't realize, but they're using a lot of phosphorus. Just think about uh, blooms. You know, phosphorus mm -hmm. for blooms. Uh, tr uh, superphosphate mm -hmm. is something that a lot of people use. Miracle Grow. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what it is, and I've seen people use that stuff every day. You, you know, in their careful. gardens or at least once a week, and they don't realize they're putting a lot of phosphorus right. uh, into their soil beds. So. The most important thing that you can take from this is the soil. You know, check your soil. You don't have to check it every year. Right. And what does a soil test cost now? Seven dollars. Seven bucks. Man, it's the best seven dollar investment of your yes. money. You know, this bag of yes. fertilizer probably costs ten. Yeah, ten or fifteen. Or, or more, sure. Fifteen mm -hmm. maybe. And you know, chances are this fertilizer will last you twenty years if you yeah. follow a soil test. And, and how, how often do we need the soil test? It's usually what, three every to two five? or three years. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I, I would, I would probably three years. I would say be three, a good, yeah, you know, three, three five years, years would be, yeah. would be the, the, you know, most often that I would do it. So, Amanda, you've, I've done, done this? a soil test, and okay. it's good. amazing to me how different areas in your yard, no matter how close they are, if you're vegetable gardening in one, and then you have shrubs and mm -hmm. just your regular landscape, how much the soil varies and what items it needs and what items it has. So I definitely see the benefit in it. You can't 
you can't beat the recommendations. They're they're from the state. Mm -hmm. and they've got the equipment to do all of that. All right. Well, just, there you have it. Just okay. be sure you put all the plants that you want to that you have in yeah. your landscape. Yes. Put everything. Put yeah. blueberries, azaleas, and, you know, if it's 20 different plants, list them mm -hmm. all and they'll give you, at no extra charge, uh, recommendations on each of those plants. All right, well, here you have it from the experts. <laughs> all right, our master gardeners and Mr. D. That's all we have time for today. Don't forget, we'd love to see some pictures of your family plot. So send us an email or letter with some photos and let us help answer your gardening questions. I'm Chris Cooper, thanks for watching, and be sure to join us next time for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you.